Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, welcome to the Inside Out Lectures, a prestigious international visiting speaker series whose mission is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across the School of Art, Architecture and Design at Leeds Beckett University. To this end, we have flown in renowned speakers from France, Australia, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada and the USA. In order to enhance the cultural life of Leeds, we make the lecture series open to the general public and available to an international audience online via the LARC website. If you want to go there, it's www. That's maybe too many Ws. Um, <laughs> leedsbeckett.ac.uk forward slash LARC, L-A-R-C. And uh, lots of our previous films, uh, fantastically filmed by Lumens here, are also available online for you to watch at home in the enjoyment of your own living room. Um, firstly, I must thank our associate partners, who I'm pleased to see are here today, the Lawrence Stern Trust, who have made Derek Bewley's visit possible by appointing him as poet in residence. To welcome our honoured guest speaker today, Derek Bewley, from Calgary in Canada, I could give you the regular spiel. He's run two publishing imprints, he's published hundreds of books by leading artists and poets across the globe, has been appointed as Calgary's Poet Laureate from 2014 to 16, is the author-editor of 18 books of poetry, prose and criticism, etc., etc. But rather than do that, I would like to tell you what a privilege it is to spend even five minutes in this poet's presence. Yesterday, it's eight o'clock in the morning, and Derek and I are walking up from the station to the university, and Derek says to me, my students in Calgary, they complain that there's no history of famous artists from our city. And so Derek answers them, do you know who Brian Gisson is? Let me tell you seven amazing facts about Brian Gisson. Number one, he was thrown out of the surrealist art movement by Andre Breton for being homosexual. Number two, with W.S. Burroughs, he takes the cut-up, which maps the poetic invention of Tristan Zara and the Dadaists onto the prose of the Beat Generation and avant-garde authors at the end of the 20th century who go on to include chance procedures in their writing. Number three, Gissin introduces Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones to Middle Eastern music in the form of the drummers of Marrakesh, the master musicians of Jujuku, which predates the Beatles traveling to India. Gissin is the first to introduce world music to pop music. Number four, he invents the first sculpture intended to be viewed with your eyes closed. His dream machine produces dreamlike hallucinations in the waking mind by manipulating flashing lights that stimulates an REM state. Number five, Brian Gissin creates the recipe for hash brownies in the Alice B. Toklas cookbook. Number six, he is trained as a linguist in Chinese and Japanese by the Canadian Secret Service and works for the government as a spy. Number seven, in 1946, he wrote and published the first book in history about the Canadian slave trade. And the final fact, he was born in Edmonton, Calgary, 20 miles down the road from here. Then Derek, as we are walking across the car park, outside the Rose Bowl, just outside here, points at a fire safety sign and says, that's really funny. The sign looks just like William S. Burroughs and Brian Gissin's concept of the third mind. As Brian Gissin and William Burroughs put it so eloquently in their publication, The Third Mind, as they worked to finish each other's cut-up sentences to make one complete sentence. Brian Gissin, it says that when you put two minds together, William Burroughs, there is always a third mind, Brian Gissin, a third and superior mind, William Burroughs, as an unseen collaborator. So you can see, you can learn quite a lot just spending five minutes with Derek. It's a real pleasure and privilege to have the Canadian poet Derek Bewley with us here at Leeds Beckett University. Please join me in extending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to Derek Bewley. Thank you, Simon. Um, it's been a real privilege to be here since um, Sunday afternoon. I am so impressed and so thankful to Simon and Valerie and their family, to the, the staff and the faculty here, the undergraduate and graduate students, the larger community, to Patrick and the amazing, amazing Shandy Hall. It's, uh, you have an incredible facility here. You have an incredible community here. And um, 
I am so privileged to be invited into the conversation. Thank you for spending a little bit of time and, by, uh, and, and for welcoming me. I really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to do a bit of an overview as to uh, three, three projects I've been working on, uh, all of which present uh, reading fiction in a uh, different and productive way. But I'd like to start with a quote from Italo Calvino. Uh, I, I joked before I didn't need a mic that I, I, I have a teenage daughter and I'm used to teaching undergraduates. Can you hear me at the back of the room? Okay, cool. So uh, I'm going to start with a quote from Italo Calvino from If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. I've become so accustomed to not reading that I don't even read what appears before my eyes. It's not easy. They teach us to read as children, and for the rest of our lives, we remain the slaves of all the written stuff they fling in front of us. I may have had to make some effort at first to, to, to learn to not read, but now it comes quite naturally to me. The secret is not refusing to look at written words. On the contrary, you must look at them intensely until they disappear. With the publication of 19, in 1968 of A, a novel, Andy Warhol quipped that he published the book as a means of publishing a bad novel because, quote, doing something wrong, doing something the wrong way, always opens doors. Warhol's first book was 1954's 25 Cats Named Sam and One Blue Pussy. His second, A, a novel, shifted his practice from illustration to something else. A, a novel, consists solely of the transcribed conversations of factory denizen Robert Oliva on Dean. On Dean's amphetamine-addled conversations, and supposedly that's what the A in A, a novel stands for, amphetamines, uh, were captured on audio tape as he haunted the factory, hailed cabs to late-night parties, and traded gossip with Warhol and his coterie. The tapes, uh, which were uh, trans uh, recorded over a number of years, were quickly transcribed by a series of stenography students, ultimately including the Velvet Underground's drummer, Mo Tucker, and are rife with typographic errors, censored sections, made-up sections when the students couldn't quite understand what was being said, and a chorus of voices. The 451 pages of transcriptions became unedited, a new kind of pop artifact. A, a novel favors faithful transcription over plot, chance over predicted composition, and a novel's ideas over its actual content. This also, this talk ends up also kind of being a love letter to information as material. So, um, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Simon. Uh, with the uh, okay, so building upon my previous novels, Flatland, uh, Romance of Many Dimensions in 2005, and Local Color in 2008, my version of A, a novel, is an erasure based translative response to Warhol's controversial masterpiece. On each page of Warhol's original, I erased all of the text, leaving only the punctuation marks and the sound effect, the automatopoeia words. Everything else has been deleted. Ted Adorno, in his essay, Punctuation Marks, urges that punctuation marks are the traffic signals of literature, and that there is no element in which language resembles music more than in the punctuation marks. The resultant text is a novelistic ballet mechanique, an orchestration of the traffic signals and street noise of 1960s New York City, an eruption of traffic and tires, overheard music, and construction noise. A, a novel minds writing for the musicality of the urban environment, the complex of non-narrative sounds embedded within our conversations. The wreckage is a found symphony, a score for New York, a new writing which uses graphic marks and detritus to explore the edges of the novelistic leaving gesture and scansion, white space and color to build narrative. 
To quote Kenneth Goldsmith, conceptual writing, of which I would consider this work, <coughs> employs intentionality, uh, intentionally self and ego effacing tactics using uncreativity, unoriginality, illegibility, appropriation, plagiarism, fraud, theft, and falsification in all its precepts, information management, word processing, databasing, and extreme process as its methodologies, and boredom, valuelessness, and nu nutritionlessness as its ethos. With these concerns foregrounded, writers assert themselves not through declarations of voice and emotion, <coughs> but through information strategies. Faced with an unprecedented amount of available text, the problem is not needing to write more of it. Instead, we must learn how to negotiate the vast quantities of it. <coughs> how I make my way through this thicket of language, how I manage it, how I parse it, how I organize it and distribute it, that's what distinguishes my writing from yours, says Goldsmith. Conceptual writing embraces writing as a plastic art, <coughs> as a sculptural art, writing as material, writing as language as process, language as something to be shoveled into a machine and then spread across pages, only to be discarded and recycled once again. Instead of Ezra Pound's Make It New, conceptual writers, as typified by a number of folks who have presented here at Inside Out, Natalie Check, Craig Dworkin, Rob Fitterman, Christian Book, as well as your very own Simon Morris and the University of Leeds' Nick Thurston, uh, often look to land artist Robert Smithson, conceptual artist Saul LeWitt, and, and pop artists Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol for their rallying slogans. And, you know, poets and writers love rallying slogans. John's instruction to take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, do something else to it, cannily reflects conceptual writing and its response to the contemporary bulk of language. You don't need to create anything. Just take what you've got and manipulate it. That said, there are a few conceptual writers who engage with the non-semantic, visual implications of language. Most look to what Robert Smithson in 1966 referred to as the heap of language and focus on the words themselves with little consideration for the page's graphic potential. <coughs> with Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, the, oh, it's over here too, this one here, uh, which Information as Material published in 2007 and was re-released on UbuWeb uh, digitally online as a PDF in 2010, and Local Color, which is not open, looks like this, which was published in Finland by Levi Leto's Press in Tamil in 2008 and re-released it by Eclipse, Craig Dworkin's uh, online uh, PDF repository in 2011, I focus not on semantic content but on the physical arrangement of source texts embodying Smithson's language to be looked at and or things to be read. Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions, is a page-by-page -page translation of Edwin Abbott Abbott's 1884 novel of the same name. Abbott's novel is an allegorical critique of the British class system and the lack of education for women in the late 19th century. It has remained in print for over a century and recounts the tale of its protagonist, A Square, a conscious, two-dimensional, quadrangle who inhabits flat land, a two-dimensional world occupied entirely by polygons. A square, our hero, is visited by a sphere, not a circle, a sphere, a denizen of a three-dimensional world who presents the blasphemous doctrine of higher dimensions and higher thinking. The sphere squires A square on a Dickensian tour of a series of different worlds, including Pointland, Lineland, Flatland, and Spaceland, and theorizes the fourth and fifth dimensional planes of existence, which is why it has remained in print all these years. It's not staying on because of its quality as a, sci uh, as a science fiction text. Scientists are requiring it to stay in print as a scientific press uh, book because 
just as the characters who are two-dimensional theorize a three-dimensional space, scientists in our world, the three-dimensional one, are trying to posit a fourth or a fifth dimension and are using how language is described in the book to help them articulate this problem. My translation applies to the cold logic of Flatland's denizens with a procedurality that openly embraces conceptualism. Basically, I turn the page itself into a flat land occupied by lines and polygons. With paragraphs on conceptual art, 1967, conceptual artist Saul Lewitt postulates a new grammar for construction. Form, says Lewitt, is of very limited importance in terms of itself, but it becomes the grammar of the total work. Lewitt argues that conceptual art requires that the basic unit be deliberately uninteresting, as to allow the form to be merely a unit for composition. So those of you who are both bored so far, you're doing fine. Deliberately uninteresting. To work with a plan that is preset, says Lewitt, is one way of avoiding subjectivity. It also obviates the necessity of designing each work in turn. The plan would design the work, the artist should select the basic form, and rules that would govern the solution of the problem. After that, the fewer decisions made in the course of the completing the work, the better. This eliminates the arbitrary, the capricious, and the subjective as much as possible. With, such, with Sentences on Conceptual Art, 1969, Lewitt postulates in 35 numbered statements a new means for production that removes the artist's subjectivity, replacing it with a dedication to process. Three of the points. The concept of a work of art may involve the matter of the piece or the process in which it is made. Once the idea of the piece is established in the artist's mind and the final form is decided upon, the process is carried out blindly. <laughs> there are many side effects that the artist cannot imagine. These may be used as ideas for new works. And lastly, the process is mechanical and should not be tempered with. It should run its course. My translation of Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions, applies Lewitt's procedurality to reading and mapping. Over a year... I mapped the occurrence of each unique letter on the first line of each page in the 1991 Princeton University Press edition of Abbott's Flatland. As Marjorie Perloff writes in the afterword, she says, on the very last page of the novella, the original reads, and that is the hope of my brighter moments. Alas, it is not always. Deleting the duplicate letters results in T-H-A-I-S-E-O-P-F-R-M-B-R-G- NLW. I then draw a line from the first appearance of the T on the first line to its, uh, to its appearance on the second line, the third line, all the way down the page, and then followed on with the H and the A and so on for each unique letter on that first line of text. Says Perloff, it is undoubtedly a labor intensive experience, but what's the point? Marjorie's, uh, <laughs> but what's the point, she said. The point is, as Lewitt theorizes, to establish a procedural reading practice and to follow that reading practice mechanically through the entirety of a single volume. I was dedicated to Lewitt's, Lewitt's advice that once the idea of the piece is established in the artist's mind and the final form is decided, the piece is carried out blindly and that the process is mechanical and should not be tempered with. It should run its course. The process for creating flatland by hand with a light table, onion skin paper, ruler, and pen resulted in a series of diagrams that contain no repetition, no discernible information, and are purely an exercise in sameness and difference. Reading with flatland is not a matter of gathering information, gaining knowledge, or amusement. It is the graphing and charting of progress through a temporal object. And books are temporal objects. They take time. Reading, in this context, means to look closely at what is in front of you so that you become familiar with the circuit of differentials presented. In constructing Flatland, my role to was, was to become more of a draftsman, echoing my previous employment, more a draftsman than a writer. My role was not to, cr to apply creative inspiration, but to employ what's uh, playfully referred to as uncreative solutions, 
such as those proposed by Lewitt again. The draftsman and the wall enter a dialogue. The draftsman becomes bored, but later, through this meaningless activity, finds peace or misery. That sounds like the process of building this book. Uh, peace or misery. With each radically different page, Flatland unfurls EKGs of the appearance of letters, pulsating stock reports that offer nothing to the potential investor. Flatland is coldly unreadable, occupied with charting appearance and not with conveying information or making meanings in the usual way, but with the relationship of a new Lippin constraint to difference. The non-identity of nominals Duchamp called the infra-thin. Foregrounding statistical analysis and diagramming over semantic content, Flatland is colder and more clinical than Dworkin and minus the sensuality of Stein, said Kenneth Goldsmith. A completely unreadable work, yet one based entirely on language. Local color is built upon my explorations of the combining of concrete poetry and conceptual writing, um, combined with my love of Lego. Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, is a black and white charting of alphabetic occurrence, applying an awareness of the flatness of the page to the description of the fictional flatland. With local color, I apply similar reading techniques to Paul Auster's 1986 novella, Ghosts. Written as the second installment in his New York trilogy, Ghosts concerns the exploits of a pi private detective named Blue, who becomes embroiled in the exploits and interaction between characters named White and Black, and his own challenges in writing a novel. He's a struggling novelist. As Ghost unfolds, and Blue becomes more aware of the case for which he's been hired, the novel becomes increasingly obsessive and trapped within a vocabulary of proper names. This is how the book begins. First of all, there is blue. Later, there is white, and then there is black. And before the beginning, there is brown. Brown took him in. Brown taught him the ropes. And when brown grew old, blue took over. That is how it begins. Local color is the result of a strict, constrained reading of ghosts based not, based not on plot, character development, or a readerly urge to solve the mystery of the novel, but rather simply on the occurrence of words, the material objects of writing on the page. Auster's Ghosts is as preoccupied with the clockwork mechanizations of detective fiction as it is with the evocation of the streets and locales of Brooklyn Heights and Manhattan, with ongoing references, of course, to Walt Whitman's previous residence on Orange Street. The, the passage in Ghost that gives local color its name reads, Walt Whitman handset the first edition of Leaves of Grass on this street in 1855, and it was here that Harry Ward Beecher rallied against slavery from the pulpit of the Red Brick Church. So much for local color. Local color coolly applies Oster's logic to the text itself. Once again, reading is a cartographic feat. Local color maps the location of each chromatic word in Ghosts. As an example, isolating only the color words from that paragraph I just read you, the text would then read blue, white, black, brown, 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 blue. Reading within this constraint results in a text that abandons the purely descriptive, plot-driven narratives depending, dependent on representation, dialogue, and all the hallmarks of traditional prose. What remains are words treated as widgets and ciphers, glowing linguistic pixels that represent the local color which haunt, like ghosts, the novel from behind the cathode ray tubes of narrative. Upon excising ghosts of all non-chromatic text, I then replaced the remaining words with polygons that visually represent the semantic content of each word. I replaced the word blue with a rectangle the size of B-L-U-E, that's in, surprisingly enough, that's, you know, colored blue. It doesn't have to be difficult. Local color is a novel without words, yet one that translates and transforms, geographically and semantically, the content of Oster's ghosts into another form. 
Local color is a novel emptied of all the signals of a novel, dusted with isolated pixels, but still broadcasting into the void. <coughs> so, Local Color was originally published, as I said, through Finnish critic Leve Leto's and Tamil Press in 2008. Uh, after a year, it had sold um, an impressive and rip-roaring four copies. So, um, at that point, I approached Craig Dworkin and said, you know, this, this book is a masterpiece. Uh, it's, it's roaring off the shelves. Um, how about we, considering, you know, it's not exactly making any money, how about we scan it as a PDF and post it on Eclipse for free? And in 2010, we posted this PDF. The digital re readership has fostered, uh, the digital reissue has fostered a readership that was simply unrealizable with the print edition. It was downloaded hundreds of times the next year. It went from four people buying it to downloading for free for hundreds of times. Uh, I didn't expect this. This completely changed my mind and it completely uh, radicalized my practice. At that point, uh, I stopped caring about sales. Or at least I stopped trying to care about sales. <laughs> and, you know, still, every now and then you're like, come on, buy the damn book. But suddenly I started realizing that what was more important to me? You know, making a buck and a half a book or talking to people, having people actually read it and engage with it. And now I'm at the point where um, I've posted online PDFs of almost every single book or chapbook or publication or paper I've written, which means full text PDFs of uh, almost 200 different editions, all for free, no charge, help yourself. So, what do I do with this? I tell my creative writing students at the Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary, where I teach, that the best means of promoting their work is to participate within a network of distribution that might seem counterintuitive. They should give their work away for free. Using an extended metaphor, I describe publishing practices and assertions of copyright as being akin to contemporary zoos. Throughout the world, zoos are struggling to maintain attendance, which allows sustain, uh, economic sustainability. People aren't going to the zoo anymore. They're not paying to watch, you know, caged up animals. Zoos require that visitors come to them, pay a fee, and view the animals from a safe distance. The animals are kept behind bars, figurative or literal, and are out of contact. They are mere displays. I playfully propose that in order for zoos, and by metaphorical extension, authors, to assert a new relevance, they should release a breeding pair of underfed animals upon the general populace once a month. Each month, this breeding pair would wreak havoc on the city. The population would want to learn everything they could about the rampaging out animals. The animals, meanwhile, would ideally devour passers-by, breed, and evolve unexpectedly. These animals would be joined by another competitive and equally aggressive members of the evolutionary food chain, a pride of lions and a dale of hippopotami, for instance. In other courses, my students are taught to professionalize, to build marketability, and to treat their work with a sense of exclusivity. I completely disagree. By treating their work like, a metaphor, like my metaphorical zoos, They'll allow their work to metastasize in unpredictable and exciting means, interacting with the digital landscape in ways that are truly contemporary. With these releases into the contemporary wild, zoos and zookeepers, thus authors and poets, would be a radically new and slightly dangerous resource. The best way of creating an audience for contemporary poetics is to release your work online, giving the audience unfettered access to the text's future. I want, I, want my, I want my writing to act like uh, college students. I want them to move, to move out of their parents' home, dye their hair, get a piercing, perhaps pick up a strange disease, and when they move home, become more interesting, more intriguing people that teach their parents something. I want my, my writing to do that. Get, get peers to come home. Local color exemplifies this stance. Only once I released Local Color online did it truly begin to embody its potentiality as a, a conceptually collaborative text. 
In 2012, Ola Stahl and Carl Lind from Malmo, Sweden, sent me an email and wanted to re-release, republish Local Color through their publication studio Malmo in edit press, uh, in edit mode press. And I, I warned them, I said, listen guys, this was just published in Finland, four copies. This is not what you want to do. I give it away. And they were like, yeah, 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 we understand. This is not what we want to do. What they decided was, produced in an edition of 200 copies, Local Color Ghost Variations treats Local Color as the initiating point for a series of rewritings, collaborations, reinterpretations, and creative feedback that explore the tension between the textual narrative, this is what Ola Stahl said in his introduction, the tension between textual narrative and graphical mark, and the opening it seems to provide towards a realm of intermediality and experimentation. So Local Color Ghost Variations is a collection of unbound folios, perfect bound miniature books, leaflets, and compact discs. Gathered, gathered with a printed paper band, itself a response to the source text, Local Color Ghost Variations includes a new edition of Local Color and responses by 17 international authors, poets, and sound artists. It became a permissive node which allows the generation of further interpretations and an international discussion of the potentiality of conceptual writing. Ola continued, that he, uh, continued to write that he was most intrigued by the way in which local color seems to split Oster's narrative text open, deterritorializing it, and rendering it graphically, freeing it up by the same gesture to a potential excess of meaning. So what then happened is that, you know, I've had a number of students say, okay, great, now you just have two editions that don't pay you. Uh, you know, well done. Uh, this, this has certainly worked out well for your career. Um, what happened was Ola and Carl said, okay, we can't pay you. We're going to make these 200 copies, which are intensely, uh, intensely difficult to make all this handwork. But what we'd like you to do is uh, we'd like to fly you to Sweden, and you can stay in one of our apartments, and we're going to do a launch for the book. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite a whole bunch of those 17 artists to come to Malmo and perform the work out of your book. And we'd like you to be the MC. So come to town, introduce all of them, and find out what they've made for you. Are you interested? I'm like, okay. So the pay was not sales of the books. It was a trip to Sweden and a chance to meet and collaborate with artists I had never met before. Uh, that's way cooler than, you know, half a dozen cups of coffee. On the rare occasions that I perform sections from local color, I draw inspiration from Karl Ruderwald's performance of Prix Nobel and by Kenneth Goldsmith's performance of Gertrude Stein on punctuation. Both authors perform devoid of emotion and rely on a voicing of graft, measured, empty space. These two reading styles imbued me to, inspired me to view local color, both in publication and in performance, as what Brian Eno referred to as ambient. So, uh, my daughter's favorite album, every time I'm like, so what do you want to listen to? She always chooses this one. Her favorite album is Brian Eno's 1978 um, Music for Airports, Ambient One. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Eno proposes with, with, in the liner notes for Music for Airports that music should be a, an atmosphere or a surrounding influence, a tint Ambient music should be heard, but not necessarily listened to. Eno contrasts ambient music with Muzak and argues that, quote, whereas the extant canned music companies proceed from the basis of regularizing environments by blanketing their acoustic and atmospheric idiosyncrasies, ambient music is intended to enhance them. Whereas conventional background music is produced by stripping away all sense of doubt and uncertainty and thus all genuine interest from the music, ambient music retains those qualities. And whereas Muzak's intention is to brighten the environment by adding stimulus to it, thus supposedly alleviating the tedium of routine tasks and leveling out the natural ups and downs of the body's rhythms, ambient music is intended to induce calm and a space to think. 
So this is not what you hear in the supermarket. Eno's formulation builds upon Eric Satie's theorizing of furniture music. Frustrated by music in public spaces that was too assertive, distracting diners and gallery attendees from appreciating their own conversations, Eric Satie proposed music that would be part of the surrounding noise and that would take them into account. He writes, I see it as melodious, as masking the clatter of knives and forks without drowning it in completely without imposing itself. It would fill up the awkward silences that occasionally descend on guests. It would spare them the usual banalities. Moreover, it would neutralize the street noise that indiscreetly forced themselves into the picture. Satie's proposal suggests music is meant to blot out extraneous noise, creating a neutralized palette that fills up the awkward silences. Satie's furniture music would remain effortlessly in the background, an inoffensive rendering wash, a relaxing wash, rendering all spaces prepared for discussion and thought. Eno asserts that ambient music must be able to accommodate many levels of listening attention without enforcing one in particular, must be as ignorable as it is interesting. You know, like fiction. If poetry or fiction is to be responsive to the everyday and to be a mirror of existence, then it should reflect, as accurately as possible, the means by which we approach text. Poetry and writing should not assert anything at all. It should be nothing but smooth and undistinguished commentary on the textual landscape within which we reside. With local color, I propose a form of writing that takes Eno's formulation of ambient music as a tint, literally. Dispensing with words, local color is weightless and pristine, unmarked by language consisting solely of tinted rectangles. What could be less engaging and less offensive? Eno promotes an ambient aesthetic that creates space to think and enhances the mood. I prefer an ambient writing which is closer to the materiality of concrete poetry and the, ta and the statements of Robert Smithson. Smithson famously argues that my sense of language is that it is matter and not ideas. It is, i.e., printed matter. And that, he continues, language should not find itself in the physical world and not end up locked in an idea in somebody's head. Writing should generate ideas into matter and not the other way around, not matter into ideas. Smithson supports the poetic prioritization of the material of language, his infamous heap of language. Eno looks to an ambient stylistics in order to create a flattened, peaceful, artistic space designed to enhance such ethereal ideas as mood, calm, and a space to think. The lights did just go out, right? <laughs> I would rather suggest that an ambient poetic should be more reflective of the modern milieu, emphasizing the overwhelming graphic textual ecology. These two volumes embrace conceptual poetics of appropriation and ambient stylistics of restaurants, the ambient stylistics of restaurants, and other boring public spaces. Instead of pointing at the wash of language that inhabits public space, the what and the how much, local color focuses on the geographical layout of that information, the where. With local color, all semantic content is lost in, fair, in favor of chroma. These rectangles created with MS Paint, Microsoft Paint, which is the digital equivalent of using a house painter's roller. It's a blunt digital instrument not known for subtlety. The, they replace text with swatches, linguistic content with a measured patch of color. I extend Eno's insistence that ambient music must be able to accommodate many levels of listening attention without enforcing any one in particular, by formulating a text that does not enforce any particular reading. So this text, both of these, started informing... Um, the creation of a novel. An a novel 
uh, was published by Paris's Jean Boit editions this past July. And it adds to the aesthetic and cons compositional concerns of my previous two books. Excising most of Warhol's text, I have created a 451-page novel using only punctuation marks and his automatopoeia. The early ex example I can find of an author only using punctuation to the exclusion of all other alpha alphanumeric signs in the creation of literature, as far as I can tell, is Charles-Georges Coquelet de Chaupierre's 19, uh, 1770 novel, La Rue Virtu. In the 20th and 21st century, authors have created a series of punctuation-only novels and poems. Lebanese Canadian Chant Basmagian's Boundaries, Limits, and Space, Swedish poet sculptor Karl Rutherswald's Prix Nobel, and notably American Jen Burvin's The Dickinson Composites and Draft Notation. Each text uses erasure and deletions to create textual illusion, alluding to absences, speech gaps, and voiced si uh, silent voices, silenced voices. And each poem creates a minimalist field of hesitancy, doubt, and the pause where speech forms. Now, um, there, was other, there was one other major figure that kind of haunted in the background of the creation of a novel, just as he haunted in the background of Warhol's New York City. And that's John Cage. Premiering August 29th, 1952, John Cage's 4 minutes 33 seconds is often referred to as his silent piece of music. For 4 minutes and 33 seconds, the performer at the premiere, pianist composer David Tudor, enters the stage, lifts the piano lid, uh, the piano's lid, and sits motionless for the length of the composition over the three movements, 33 seconds, 2 minutes and 40 seconds, and finally 1 minute and 20 seconds. Just sits there. Cage's piece is vastly misunderstood by a popular audience, for it's not silence at all. It embraces the ambient sounds of the performance space and requests that the audience listen as closely as possible to the sounds that they would have, in a way that they would have listened to a traditional concerto. Cage argued, Cage argued that there is no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering on the roof. And during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. Warhol's novel centers on speech, on the conversations and talk that makes up the 1960s art scene. Upon removing that speech, thus applying Warhol's dictum that my mind is like a tape recorder with one button, erase. The pages of a novel are not left blank. They are littered with the sonic detritus of New York. With all the dialogue removed, Warhol's novel echoes John Cage's 433. The pages of a novel may look hollow, but they include the background noise of traffic and overheard conversations, radios, and music from passing cars and open windows, each part of a portrait of New York City's clamor. What I then did is, while I was composing this, and creating this as a daily practice. And one of the things I tell my art students is the best thing they could learn in art school is to have a daily practice. Every day you have to make something. So every day, I created a Twitter account, and every day I posted one of the pages until 451 days later it was done. I then posted uh, a link to all the pages and invited uh, artists from around the world in an open call to produce sound recordings, create something using sound that responds to these as visual score. Do with it anything you wish. Uh, there's going to be, uh, very soon, there's going to be a CD release of those, of those recordings. And I wanted to share uh, two of them to start with. The first one, uh, by Craig Conroy, 
uh, who lives in Florida. He took the first couple pages of a novel and transformed it into what he called uh, clockwork punctuation. where every part of each punctuation mark is assigned uh, the interior sound of a cuckoo clock. So the, the, uh, the full stops are the tick, and the commas are the talk. Uh, the, the Norwegian uh, concrete poet and sound artist, uh, Cecilia Orjas Jordheim, created this piece from page 343. I'd like to open. Open with no pad. Open with here we are. <coughs> no. This was open before you came along, so it should work. Oh dear. None of those are play. Up oh, here we are. And this piece is entitled. Dick isn't that big, which is a quote from page 343. Rattle, gurgle, clink, tinkle. Click, pause, click, ring, dial, dial, ondine. You said dial that, that, that. If, 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 if you pick up the mayor's voice on the other end, dial, pause, dial, dial, dial. The mayor's sister would know us, be, be, be like, be like, uh, 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 busy, busy, busy. Drella, we should start the park, right? Okay, hmm. Coin drops, money jingles as coin returns, car noises in background. You're a clunk. Are there any way stations on the way that we have to honk, honk, like I was, uh, what, what noise? And we go through, through the park, is there any place we can keep calling your, uh, I mean, right through the, uh, uh, the phone call, is there any place we could call them if we, answering service, you, cars honking, blasting, are there different places, are there different places that we can call your answering, oh, you want some cake, nah, a little juice, anything, I know where we can get some, oh yeah, let's get some, fantastic baby, yeah, good, oh, you can't pretend that you're not here, oh, okay, all right, you're, uh, I mean, all right, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, here, yeah? <clears throat> okay, you're here. Okay, you definitely are here. Uh, hey, what time is it? Do you know what, what time it is exactly? It, it's two o'clock? Uh, Gary, uh, Jerry made me, uh, I had to wait for him. It's all right. Did you know what happened? I fell asleep on the bus. It's all right. Did you know what happened? Yeah, did you? 
And uh, yeah, I got, I got, I got off, I got off, I got off in time, and I realized that the bus ride was so long, it's ridiculous. It's, 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 the Fifth Avenue bus takes forever. Let's see. The bus was, 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 we had a fairly good time last night, but not too special. Um, nothing really. Just a couple of sheets on, and went into somebody's house, and scared them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was all, I, I, I felt like a ghost. Yeah, some have stolen rotten Rita's causes, and um, now some of my throat is gone. Really? Yeah. Ah, uh, is it, what's it from? Blowing? No, I didn't blow a thing last night. Just general, you know, just staying up and all that, and just talking. The number in front of us is just too gorgeous. Do you have any? Do you have, I want some blue ones. No, they're five milligrams. Yeah, that's good. Ten milligrams? No, there are, 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 the, are, are they ten or five? Ten? Ten? Oh, well, then I need... I'll try some orange ones, too. Yeah? Oh, the orange ones are divine. How many do you want of the blue ones? Oh, let's see. Twenty milligrams of forty... Ten. Ah, see, uh, uh, uh. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hey, hey, that's too many to take. We got giggle. Sixty milligrams. Yeah, let's see what set would be. Oh, oh, okay, you can't blame the front of this outfit. It's all bare skin. Oh, that's horrid. It's very stupid. <coughs> Blah, he has a horrid face. Really? He looks like a, like, like, what a body. I, I, okay, I, I, I was wondering what you would like to do besides that. I mean, like, if we're going to spend the whole day and we should really... Oh, did you enjoy the con? What did you and Rita speak about last night, first of all? And isn't she marvelous? Yeah, isn't she, tru, 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 isn't she truly marvelous? She's the meanest girl in the world, but she's so fun. Really? Yeah, she has like a, like, you know, like, like a, like a, like a, like all mean girls, like, have been, like, she's a roughly treated. Oh, the bakery's open. It's the best bakery in town. What's the name of it? Greenberg's. Greenberg's. Ooh, that's a Jewish bakery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought it was a Chinese bakery. I sat down next to an old woman in the park, and she got very indignant. Really? Because I just sat there. Why? Well, uh, it, uh, well uh, it, was her, it was her bench, obviously. Oh. She must have, been, must have had it since, since she, was like, she was a child. Really? She, she, she was just, people are not going to believe this. Music, music, long, deep notes, gradually slowing down and stopping. Pause. Music picks up. Music, noise, silence. Music, pause. Buzz, 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 pause, 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 noise, noise of voices in background, garble, pause, buzzer, mumble, mumble, loud music, very loud music, trumpets, <coughs> whispering, laughing, pause. Music, loud music, sniffing sounds, laughing, sirens, music, Laughter, laughter, music, sirens. Pause. Sirens. Sirens. Sirens, laughter, voices. Music. Music. Sirens outside, pause. Music. Gasp. Laughter, music, pause, voices, music. Interference. Silence, pause. 
silence, pause, interference, laughter, interference, interference, pause, long, pause, 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 piano, 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 piano and piano, mumbling, <coughs> piano, piano gets louder with the music, piano, 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 piano gets faster and louder, tss, tss, tss. gasp and noises, piano, talking, music, long pause, humming noise and piano, voices in background, voices become louder, humming, rumbling, voices in background, music, rumbling, music, rumbling noise, 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 music is loud, voices, opera, crash, opera, noise, opera, 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 voices, opera, opera, the phone rings, opera, ring, smack, opera, smack, makes a noise, opera, opera, voices, boing, opera is very loud, noise, pause, pause, boing, boing, rustling paper, long pause, voices muffled by opera, horse, static, static, bong, cough, static, static and opera, the opera is very loud, bong, snores. Thank you very much.